You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. You, you falling off a cliff is not the same as watching someone fall off a cliff. No, definitely not. This week on Backward Compatible, we sit down with Professor Thomas Riccio, the poopa do of the dead white zombies, to discuss the relevance of theater, mythologies, and ritual in the modern age, plus the similarities between installation performance and game design. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 12. Uh, as always, I'm Chris, and we're actually doing something a bit different today. Um, we're doing a one-on-one interview with uh, a man named one of Dallas's top 100 creatives by the Dallas Observer. It's uh, Tom Riccio. Uh, very good to have you here today, Tom. All right. Good to be, good to be here. Um, so you're kind of known as, um, or at least as far as I'm aware, kind of the theater guy here at UTD. Um, is there anyone else here that uh, does that sort of thing? Uh, Fred Fred Kerchak is my my colleague. So basically, okay. it's uh, as far as those creating work, it's Fred and I. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and you're also the uh, head of um, Dead White Zombies, which I'm is Poopa Vu <laughs> There you go. It's a, it's a cool title, yeah. um, and it makes sense to have that title given that uh, Dead White Zombies is a rather, um, I guess you could say, experimental group working in theater and performance here locally. Um, yeah, we just do what we want to do, uh, how we want to do it. So if it's people think it's experimental, then that's what we, mm-hmm. we call ourselves. But Very we cool. just do what we do. Awesome. Um, which actually raises a um, the first question I wanted to ask you, and it's maybe a bit loaded, maybe a bit unfair. Um, but I imagine a lot of people today, given the um, dominance of you know movies and TV and stuff like that, um, they might wonder kind of what's the relevance of theater today. Um, yeah, what's the relevance? Well, theater is all around us. I mean, we live in performance narratives, increasingly narrativized reality, um, being processed by politics, governments, uh, consumer uh, corporations, uh, telling you what shirt to wear and if you're cool or not. <laughs> iTunes. I mean, you're walking through these kind of like mediated, controlled, performative spaces. I mean, how should you behave? What should you say? And all that. So in a sense, um, maybe certain forms of theater are kind of an, an antique mm-hmm. and they're dated yeah. um, and they're not even interesting and relevant to me. But in a sense, I see performances having transcended the, the restrictions of uh, formal spaces. Sure. Um, much like television has transcended the restrictive spaces of 1960s three networks in your living room you know uh, and then going off the air at one in the morning type mm-hmm. of spaces uh, it's everywhere you know on your I- I- iPhone iPad whatever uh, and you can watch friends all over the world so it's transcended nation and, uh, and uh, media barriers mm-hmm. um, so in a sense we I, I look at performance that I, I do is um, uh, being seamless with with the narratives of our life and actually um, pulling out aspects of of our uh, of our, of our own life and mm-hmm. putting it into a performance form so we can kind of like observe mm-hmm. so the viewer becomes a participant observer in a way so okay. and as a consequence we're always doing site specific spaces mm. um, and non-traditional uh, theater forms like a former crack house a new one is in a former ice house mm-hmm. we've done warehouses um, welding shops mm-hmm. so whatever we can do it on the street it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah yeah um, and we just want to kind of you know mess and fuck with people's heads uh, <laughs> to show them that things are can be messed and, and fucked we're being fucked with mm. uh, and that's kind of like the the uptake I don't know does that answer your question uh, yeah it does it's uh, <laughs> definitely uh, gets uh, begins to get there and I was actually going to ask um, because you mentioned that you know, I some, can cuss on this program, right? Oh, definitely. Oh, good. Definitely. We've done it before. Right. <laughs> um, we, uh, 
you mentioned that some forms of theater are starting to become a bit antiquated. And, um, you know, they're still around, of course, um, especially kind of uh, for schools, you know, people sort of training up to be actors and writers and directors. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it's not the same sort of, um, hey, what should we do for entertainment tonight? Let's go to the theater and see this play. You know, not so much anymore. Um, And so it seems like in order to make a splash in a way, theater now almost has to um, do things like the installation pieces that you mentioned and do things that kind of, um, in a way, do what other media can't, you know? Um, I, I was very intrigued. Uh, one of the Dead White Zombies pieces that I actually um, saw, not in person, but I saw um, a video that you sent me, uh, was uh, TNB. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the one that took place in the former crack house. Um, and it was very interesting to watch because I saw that all the audience members were actually standing in the same rooms as these actors, um, like two feet away from them as this stuff was happening. Um, also very intriguing that the actors would sometimes um, interact directly with audience members, get them involved. Um, so it's interesting to me that in a way it seems like you're intending to make people uncomfortable and I think this is actually a very cool thing um, because we're so used to, um, with this modern technology that you mentioned, being kind of a step removed from everything, um, being a little bit less personal than we used to be. Um, mm-hmm. I find it interesting that we can have that, that sort of um, uh, gain your face person to person interaction even if it is sort of um, uh, set up as a piece of fiction that's happening. A- absolutely. Uh, because we're, in, in a sense, that's what corporations are doing. Mm. I mean, they're in your face. Yeah. I mean, they're, it's nice and warm and fuzzy, <laughs> and you can, you're cool and all that, mm-hmm. uh, but basically it, you're being played. Sure. You know, um, and so, and we're doing the same thing. We're playing you, but we're making you aware that you're being played. Mm-hmm. And hopefully it will make you aware when you go through your life that there's another level to the statement uh, that you're in, that the event you're in interacting with, yeah. and the statements that you're receiving, mm-hmm. you know, from various media forms mm-hmm. uh, to question it, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's, that's the whole idea, and that's the kind of like jostle your, and that's the, how we serve things. It's less to be go for things to be sensational. It's basically, um, you know, like the. Because we, we deliberately do small audiences. We want mm-hmm. intimacy. Sure. So the crack house is limited to like 30 people. Mm-hmm. And we turn people away. It's like, and we add performances and stuff. But basically, it's not, you know, if we wanted to make money, we wouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. But you do like, and that's why you have the, the multiplier of like a, a theater that's 700 seats and, you know, and, and, and you do multiple performances, mm-hmm. et cetera, because you basically want to make money on it. Right. Not that we, we want to lose money, it's just that we break even or we make money, and then uh, we have a following. Mm-hmm. So people, uh, many people have never seen our work, but they are enthusiastic about it, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> so it's important that we're there to aggravate uh, uh, the, the ecosystem of, of Dallas. That's what we're about, because um, it's a very consumer-driven region mm-hmm. uh, and and we kind of like I think we're lulled into one perspective of it uh, increasingly and a lulled perspective is good for uh, sheepish behavior and mm-hmm. consumer uh, confidence in buying you know their schlock yeah yeah so cool um, so kind of related to that uh, we, I mentioned to you before you came on that what our website tends to be about mainly is about gaming um, and so we uh, we, we talk a lot about the narratives within games. We talk about um, the interactivity of games, that sort of thing. Um, and while we don't talk about it a ton, we do have backgrounds in things like level design, environment design, um, sort of thinking about how you lay out a stage in order to sort of communicate through the environment or through the things happening in the environment, the way that the player and the non-player characters are going to interact with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious if you could comment a bit on um, the way you go about in these installation pieces designing the environment um, what considerations you take as far as um, making it work for the play, picking it for the play in the first place, um, how you intend the audience to move through and what you intend them to experience, that sort of thing. Well, that's a, quite a few questions there. <laughs> um, basically, we, we get a space and the space is a character. So we look at the space as speaking to us and what is it offering? Cool. Uh, what's its history? What, what's implied by the space? What was its original use? Um, what's its use now? What's the feel? Kind of an, you intuit the feel. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and it kind of tells you how people should move through and how to react and what the expectations are. Uh, for TMB, uh, we had, for instance, uh, we inhabited the, um, the house maybe a week after the former owner left. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was very fresh. In fact, there were still pot plants growing, which we mm -hmm. let them grow in the, in the backyard. Um, and there was a, a back fence, so we had, uh, which is right near an open field mm -hmm. where we had people park. And so basically, we cut a hole in the fence, and so people had to enter through the backyard uh -huh. like they're doing a break, a B and E, you know. And so they enter right. through the the, the, uh, the back door, uh -huh. you know, like they're breaking in, mm -hmm. you know, like <laughs> surreptitiously, you know. So and so, and the idea was um, to to kind of like alter people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the piece, we had like a. a like an informal party in the back, you know, <laughs> party lights up and, and stuff. So it, it, it's, it's, and it's in the hood, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I was curious, actually, how did the neighborhood react to that? Did they know you guys were putting the event Oh, on? yeah, we invited them all and some cool. came by and they, they you know, uh, when we were rehearsing, uh, people would knock on the door and they were looking for drugs. Huh. You know, and the guy answering the door, our lead character is a former gangbanger, so he'd answer the door, <laughs> and, they, and they'd say, you know, we're doing a play, and they'd like look at his like, you know, blankly, and he, you know, and he, and he just like sent them on their on their way. Huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but these cars with the you know the big mag wheels that spin and stuff would drive up with the tinted windows, looking for mess mescaline or I don't know what the hell they're looking for, mm -hmm. you know, methamphetamines. So they were there, and you know, we put them away. But we we used the environment. Um, as far as like the gaming, your interest in gaming, um, it's we definitely modulate in how they come through. The whole ex user experience is very important for us. Uh -huh. um, the new piece we're working on now called Karaoke Motel will use as a premise the motel. I worked at motels when I was in high school and early part of college, and so I kind of en enamored to that whole kind of like cheap motel sensibility. Yeah, yeah, uh, and. What we'll do is we have one uh, house, which is down the road from the building we're actually performing. People will park there, check in there, mm -hmm. and then they'll be driven to the new site, the, the performance site. And the site itself will go through the 70s office, which the bad 70s carpeting and all that stuff. Uh, and you'll meet the manager mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the manageress, who will be, uh, and their scenes will take place there. But before they get there, they have to deal with the driver, and the driver is Brad Hennigan, right. who's given them like you know this this uh, you know kind of mind altering kind of like dialogue and mm -hmm. interactions, and showing pictures of his girlfriend on his cell phone of her puking and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, to just kind of like jostle people, sure. And so they're not sure who he is and yeah. what he's about and why we're and, in his van. <laughs> and, and is he friend or foe or right, what? Right. So there's ambiguity. And then they go, and then there's uh, at the, the door that someone's welcoming them, and then what will happen is we have this like corridor, uh, which we call like the fallopian tube, mm -hmm. which is uh, which will be uh, uh, flashed with animations, and it's a large uh, uh, fabric tube that people individually have to walk into, and then they're dumped into the manager's office. Mm. So in a way, it has like kind of like a, a fun house slash horror house. Uh, haunted house type of feel, but it's a modulated space. And so once right. they, everyone goes through kind of like these first two or three moments, and so there's a unifying kind of like core, expositional core. Okay. And then thereafter, we start multiplying uh, options. And then it's up to the viewer to essentially go where they need to go. Oh, okay. And so if they want to sit, they'll sit. And so now, all of a sudden, uh, the burden is on them mm -hmm. to like, what do they want to do? You could sit there the entire time. In fact, you could probably sit in any room and with CCTV watch other rooms. Okay. And cool, so you cool. become, it holds a whole different relationship. Mm -hmm. Or you could just watch one uh, scenario unfold. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to, and then those characters will actually leave and go to other scenarios. And right, they'll be involved right. and interpolated in other scenarios. You could follow them or just stay where they are because if you stay long enough, the, uh, another scenario will come, come passing through. Cool. That, that raises the question for me, too. Um, is there kind of one sort of main line of action that happens, like, from room to room that, like, if you're just sitting down watching the CCTV, you're seeing just, like, one play fold out going through these spaces? Or is there... I understand that actors would probably be in a room, like, maybe just, like, you know... Um, doing the cleaning or whatever else might be happening kind of just in the background. Um, but is there ever any time where you have two or more um, important events to the play happening simultaneously? Um, yeah, 
in a way, we, we layer it differently. It's less a linear progression. Mm -hmm. It's more of a thematic layered progression. Okay. Uh, in a way, it's like here on campus, for instance, the main narrative is like education. Mm -hmm. So if you and I, in a sense, we're sitting here, it's part of that main narrative. Mm -hmm. All right. So if someone walks in, it's we're coherent to that narrative. It may not be their narrative where they are, mm -hmm. but you know, but it's a, we understand a part of the narrative. If you are, and I are, are in here, kind of like playing, you know, a poker game with mm -hmm. like two hookers, then it's kind of <laughs> like it's outside of the narrative. In fact, right. we are, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Later, babe. Uh, but what then? It's out of the narrative. But we go over to the student union, and they're though they may be speaking, you know, uh, uh, Urdu. Then nonetheless, it's we're assuming, and it's probably them looking at their screens as part of this uh, educational narrative. Right. So in a sense, you walk through the house. It's all part of a larger narrative. It's just different aspects of it, and what you catch. Okay. And the, and the important aspects and thematic elements will repeat okay uh, and they'll be repeated and from different angles so you'll see it either uh, sonically or uh, videographically mm -hmm. uh, throughout okay and so if you miss one one kind of like high point mm -hmm. or like important point then you can p uh, pick it up elsewhere mm -hmm. and interestingly I think that um, audience members too are probably be talking to each other after a little while um, so it's like, hey, you wouldn't believe what just happened in this room, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, which that's a very interesting idea, too, because it gets audience members talking to each other in addition to taking in the narrative that you're trying to present. It's me meant, and exactly getting back to the original uh, discussion, it's meant for people to think about what they're doing. And there are a lot of important ideas, I think fundamental ideas, being conveyed by the sensorial interaction mm -hmm. and immersion and hyper-awareness of the immersion of the narrative right. that you are a participant in it and that you're actually changing it. Because performers will adjust the, some, some uh, narrative sequences, the performer has um, the obligation mm -hmm. to adjust according to whoever's in the room. Gotcha. So, and they can repeat it, mm -hmm. uh, and they can adjust how they say it depending on who's in the room. Cool. And they'll perform it if no one's in the room. Mm. And so then it, it, it adjusts the whole idea. It's like, who do they perform for? And I found that performers actually, uh, at first they're thrown by it. Uh -huh. They're performing for nobody. But then they realize, well, who do you really perform for? Uh -huh. And so they, they, have, they develop a confidence and maybe um, a different uh, perspective on performance when they perform for one another. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting anecdote. When we did Whole, which is a similar kind of... Uh, immersive, uh, uh, determined, self-determined uh, narrative, uh -huh. which was over 36,000 square feet. Um, several people went to the show, and, the, and they, uh, this one woman and her boyfriend went, they invited other friends, they went, and then the, they invited a third couple mm -hmm. um, for a third time of seeing it. And then the third couple said it over dinner, we'll explain what this play, this. I don't I hesitate to say play. It's more performance. Okay. Uh, what this performance is about. And they all started explaining what they thought were different things. Did you mm. see the same piece? Right, right. And they go, yes, that's the whole thing of it. Um, as a director and creator of it, I cannot, once it's going, I can't see everything. Mm -hmm. If I'm in one area, I'm not in another area. And then if I don't go to that area, maybe for like two or three performances, I go back there, I go, they, they, the performers are entitled and responsible to evolve it. Cool. And so they'll evolve it in ways that I had never imagined. Mm -hmm. And they may evolve it because they're kind of knocking against various audience interactions. Mm -hmm. and, then it, and then something was spurred, so it's always evolving. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little bit of a recent discussion we had on um, a few MMOs that have come out recently, massively multiplayer online games. Um, there's one that's been around for a while that's quite popular. It's called Eve Online. Um, it's a sort of sci science fiction game. You fly around in ships. Um, and another one we've been talking about recently just came out um, a few weeks ago is called uh, Arc Age. And the idea behind these is they're totally different settings, um, but they break kind of the norm of what an MMORPG is considered to be, um, kind of the most notable one being World of Warcraft, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, where rather than having the game um, be what we call a theme park, where you go from sort of event to event and it sort of runs you through um, right. a more or less single player experience, maybe you have some friends with you to help. Um, what these games do is actually encourage players to interact with each other directly mm -hmm. um, because they sort of set up these systems and say, go have fun. Um, so what will happen in EVE especially, it's um, notorious for this, uh, 
everything in the game is actually created by a player. Um, so you have to go and like harvest resources from like you know asteroids or whatever else, um, refine them somewhere. Someone has to do that, and then someone else takes those materials and builds a ship or builds you know whatever else out of it. Um, so you actually have a uh, very real economy sort of happening within mm. the game. Um, you'll have a lot of very um, fierce competition between players, and so. The reason I bring this up is it reminds me of what you seem to be saying is that you, you come up with this narrative, you have this setting, um, you sort of train the actors on what they need to do, and then you sort of just let them loose to adapt um, as they play, much the same way that these players will um, kind of come up with narratives that you might not have expected as the designer. Do mm -hmm. um, you want to comment on that a little bit? Well, it's as I mentioned, it is it's built to evolve. I mean, there are, systems are real important for me, patterns. So what I lay down are basically patterns. Mm -hmm and it's deeply rooted in the emotion of the character. So you, people have very emotional responses to the work to the point where uh, in some pieces people are comforting characters. Uh -huh. If a character is there, they actually feel, because they're so close, mm -hmm. and, the char and they're playing mm -hmm. you know, for real. Mm -hmm. it's, it, uh, it's not, they're not playing a character, they're basically playing a character and they're connecting with a deeper part of themselves. Okay. It's 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 personal what they're doing, mm -hmm. and so people will comfort someone. So uh, it works. So but what I lay down are patterns, and then making sure the patterns link up mm -hmm. and they sync. Because there's sometimes where we'll actually have a sync system, mm -hmm. meaning we're syncing this with this now and going to another phase, mm -hmm. and so and it kind of evolves and it pushes things probably ge usually geographically to another area mm -hmm. where things then build on everything that's been established previous and now takes it to another level. Okay. And in a sense, and as you follow through it as an audience member, um, you are forced uh, by the energy of this evolution to basically respond to things are changing. Gotcha. And you have to make a decision as well or you have to interact differently. Right. So we'll transform you uh, kind of like uh, uh, geographically as we move you through things. Mm -hmm. So we'll open doors all of a sudden. For one one scene is in this new work, someone's banging on the door and he's called the, the doorkeeper. And he's just banging on the door, and, he, and, 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 and then we're in a lounge, and he's banging the door of the lounge, mm -hmm. where there's a lounge singer and a piano player. Nice. And so she asked the audience to be quiet, and we all listen to the banging of the door. And then finally, she opens the door. Mm -hmm. When she opens the door, it's another world. Mm -hmm. I mean, a whole other thing is going on in there. Huh. You nice. know? And then people pour in. They still have the option of going back, but now the main event is, is this large room, which is the ceiling is like three times the height. There's windows and there are things kind of in the air and just things are very very different there and so it's forcing you into another like mode of like uh, uh, of evolution, mm -hmm. you know. So very nice. So it's systems. It's basically I look at it as, as systems. That's really cool. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, um, I was very intrigued when I took your class on. Um, uh, mythologies and studying mythologies. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the way in which um, all media sort of like draws upon what's come before. Um, I'm sure in theater, like, you know, you, you make conscious decisions to change something about what's come before um, because you recognize that people have these expectations coming into it that you want mm -hmm. to subvert in a very artistically intentional way. Um, so. It, you, you know, I'm sure you have a lot to say, and it might take too long for this podcast. But you know, just sort of, if you want to comment a bit on your background and um, uh, studying mythology, studying ritual. Um, I know you've been all over the world studying um, ritual performance um, in Africa and elsewhere. Alaska, I know, is one that you've uh, commented on quite a bit. Um, but do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, it is, it's a big topic for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Dead White Zombies is very much inspired by my work with indigenous groups and my work with. Uh, uh, in the area of research of shamanism and ritual. Okay. Um, and in a way, those patterns are deep within us. Mm -hmm. I was talking about deep structures and stuff, so that's a deep pattern mm -hmm. that lives and that guides us. Yeah, everything I've seen from Dead White Zombies has that very sort of um, almost shamanistic, ritualistic vibe, I think. Um, kind of this uh, sense of there being some greater thing happening beyond just the world that we see, which I find pretty interesting. And that's that's another way of interrogating the narratives that we live within. Right. We can look at things in a superficial, in the moment way, and uh, or we can understand it that, mm -hmm. and then we can also understand the multiple layers that exist beneath it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, for me, is 
in a part, uh, in part, a, a evolutionary, a global evolutionary moment uh -huh. that's uh, that I want to participate in and, and kind of like forward. Cool. Uh, because we are becoming global, but we we in a sense don't have these um, the, a ritual that kind of unifies us, like right. a planetary ritual. Sure. Uh, and so, w what do we draw on? We draw on what has preceded us mm -hmm. and cultures throughout the world have basically shared similar ritual patterns. Mm -hmm. There may be differences in expression depending on Alaska Native or the South Pacific mm -hmm. and you know Papua New Guinea or something, but uh, nonetheless they're doing the same rites of passages, uh, life passages or death passages, mm -hmm. uh, maturity, circumcisions, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, um, spiritual transcendence, all these things are, are part of world cultures. Uh -huh. And so now, what what happens when you have uh, people all over the world basically uh, forming one, which is basically economic and political and social culture, mm -hmm. but not having, let's say, a spiritual or connectivity to the land they live on, right? Which is for me an imminent danger. Uh -huh. And so, part of ritual uh, in its origins and its archaic origins is the fact that it's it's a way of maintaining place. Mm -hmm. So, ritual for me is important to maintain this place called planet. Right. When people say, where do you come from? I tell them, I'm an earthling, man. <laughs> I'm from earth. I don't, I, and I go all over the world. It doesn't matter. I'm still home. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's still there. And, and I'm responsible for, for it wherever I am. Mm -hmm. And that's a mentality that is needs to be evolved and, and, um, and championed uh -huh. in some way. So in my little way, I'll do it in... Um, in the performance we have. So I, I do look for the deep structures and I do look for it in a larger scheme of things in that the deep structures are important for our evolution and for uh, survival mm -hmm. of, the, of the planet. If we are aware that we're part of something larger and then we partake in a live sensorial interaction mm -hmm. with that, then it becomes something embodied. It's right. not just a thought. Right, oh, right. You know, ecology is good, or let me turn off the lights when I leave the room mm -hmm. and recycle. No, it's like I need to understand it bodily. I need to participate in it somehow bodily. Mm -hmm. This life cycle movement and this connectivity to a place. Mm -hmm. So that's I don't know if I answered your question. But oh, it's, it definitely is. Um, definitely relates. Uh, and you know, going back once again to I think um, one of the reasons that theater can definitely be um, very relevant today um, is that you know you're talking about that bodily um, sort of experience, the sort of physicality that you get in theater because you were in the same space as these other people. Um, you're connecting on a very sort of physical level. Um, uh, you know, even if it is more traditional theater where you're sitting, you know, a few rows back in your chair and they're just up on stage and they're not directly interacting with you. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that their actual voice is, you know, bouncing around the room and hitting you, you know, there's, a, there's I think, um, not that you don't get an emotional reaction to things that are happening on a screen, for instance, but I think it can hit you differently if it's something that's actually happening to you right. physically. It's the screen is basically a, a visual sonic, and it's a reminder. Uh -huh. It's not. It's not the same. You you falling off a cliff is not the same as watching someone fall off a cliff. No, definitely not. <laughs> um, and and there's a big difference. Yeah. So uh, and that that's maybe we understand the sensorial kind of interaction in, in the world, uh, but one threat maybe of technology and gaming and animation, et cetera, and uh, hyper media mediated uh, uh, world we live in mm -hmm. is that we're becoming more distant from that which we actually now more than ever need to be more uh, hyper aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping by breaking boundaries with uh, performance in its traditional forms, mm -hmm. and it happens in a sense everywhere, we go back almost to uh, a re-evaluation of a very ancient form. Mm -hmm. In many indigenous cultures, when you walk on a, uh, an area of the land, you're basically walking mythology. Mm -hmm. You're retracing the, s the steps of ancestors and you have a responsibility, as others had had responsibility before you, to pass it on and to preserve and to protect and to listen to it. Right. Because we're so migratory, the fact that you and I are not from Dallas and mm -hmm. maybe one generation, two generations, five at the most, we're basically transitory and if a job comes to you to go elsewhere, you'll leave mm -hmm. and you'll basically go to the same 
same Starbucks and <laughs> in in uh, you know fries or whatever right, and right. micro center anywhere in the world. Uh -huh. You know, it's the equivalent. It doesn't matter. It has nothing about located the place. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, uh, as we become more global, mm -hmm. we have to become more aware of our place mm -hmm. and and our relationship to that place. Right. And one way to do it is. Uh, uh, aware, aware that we are performing every day, our every action has consequences. Right, um, and that's definitely a big part of game design is um, figuring out what actions the player can take, what the consequences of those actions are going to be. Um, a good game will make the make the actions feel meaningful because the consequences are real, um, or they make they feel real to the player. Yeah. Um, but actually, that you, you mentioned something just a second ago about. Um, uh, like going to the same Starbucks and Micro Center and all that um, all around the world um, and sort of losing that sense of place. Um, how do you sort of reconcile the idea that we need to have kind of a global ritual, kind of like a common thing that we all have versus the idea of um, going to a place and sort of understanding its um, sense of place, its own ritual, its own history? Because um, it almost sounds like, um, it, it sounds a bit like they might be mutually exclusive. Uh, in a way, if ritual's not there, we create them. Mm. So a kid in China wants a Nike shoe, mm -hmm. you know, he wants Air Jordans or whatever they're selling now, mm -hmm. um, and he wants to be dancing the same thing that you know they're dancing over here in the States and vice versa. Uh -huh. Something happens in Korea and all of a sudden we're aware of it here within the next day. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's happening already. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just happening f and it's being mediated by uh, commercial venues. Right. Uh, and some commercial venues uh, or entities are becoming aware that they have to take responsibility. And mm -hmm. so they're, the, the beginning is like making donations to the environment or whatever, or saying that we're just going to use environmentally uh, um, recycled materials or pay wages. All this is a, an awareness is really quite recent. Uh -huh. That we're aware now that that cell phone, you know, that's on the table yeah. is is basically was outsourced to China, mm -hmm. and those people may or may not be having uh, nice living conditions. Right. And and by using that, you're basically a, a neo colonialist, mm -hmm. a neo imperialist, and you're just exploiting people's labors. Mm -hmm. And if you feel good about that, then that's cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or not, or you're aware. So mm -hmm. we weren't aware of that uh, previous to maybe just like ten years ago. Sure. If less than that. And mm -hmm. so all that's part of this kind of this, this global hyper awareness mm -hmm. of our actions because mm -hmm. that the picking up the phone is a performed action right. and now it has it has narrative consequences mm -hmm. that's oh. not just a, it's not just functional it's now something political mm -hmm. as social economic and now uh, uh, moral mm -hmm. or immoral <laughs> so all that is leading and kind of pushing towards uh, like this internal mm -hmm. uh, um, sense of like place uh -huh. And awareness and connectivity. What you, what we're seeing and what can, is more obvious is the external mm -hmm. uh, awareness. But now we have this internal awareness. Uh, also, that's also I think simultaneously happening. Right. I think gaming, for me, gaming. Why gaming now? Why so big? Mm. You know, it's because the world, in a sense, has always been a game. Right. And now, because there are fewer and fewer resources and more and more people, we have to be more acutely and technically aware of how to play a game. Right. And so, performance historically, uh, a ritual for a mammoth hunters, mm -hmm. uh, right? Our ancestors, like 15,000 years ago, it, we'd watch a performance and it's like, we caught that mammoth because of, of our, our righteousness and our connectivity to the spirits and our ancestors and finding their ways. And then we also found a way of how to survive. Right. And, and how, what this larger circle were part of. They, they in a sense, their ritual was portraying what they needed to know. Mm -hmm. So now I don't go to the theater. I'm a gamer, mm -hmm. I go play a game, that game is telling me my moral value system, it's telling me things about the structures mm -hmm. of like how I need to wor work in the world mm -hmm. and how I survive and how I need to navigate it. Right. Much like a ritual, much like a play does. You go mm -hmm. to a play or see a film about like uh, AIDS or divorce or whatever, uh, how does a kid deal with divorce, the parents or separation, mm -hmm. it's basically a way of navigating how to get through, it's, it's telling what's going on, but it's mm -hmm. also, in a sense, a revelation of how to survive. Mm -hmm. And it's Game also, a revelation. it's involving the player too, because it's getting them to think about the decisions they're making, and then hopefully, um, again, if the game is well designed, um, 
making the consequences both both sensible and meaningful, uh, making it so that um, you're learning kind of what you need to learn in a way. Um, and I think that that right there is more so than, you know, like a lot of people like to freak out over, um, you know, violence in video games, um, thinking that, you know, playing violent games causes violence. Um, and I'm not going to broach that topic too much right now, but, you know, from what I've seen, generally speaking, um, it depends a lot on the person and the circumstances. Um, but actually having a frustrating game, one that um, makes you frustrated and you lose a lot and you get angry at it, um, is actually more likely to prompt aggressive behavior than aggression in the game space. Mm -hmm. um, but that aside, I think um, the bigger concern there is what you mentioned, um, playing this game sort of performing this ritual to learn something about how to survive in your environment. Um, and while I'm not saying that all games um, are along these same lines, you know, the sort of like action, violent shooters, that sort of stuff, while they have their purposes and they can tell interesting stories and be kind of, you know, fun experiences while you're looking for it as entertainment, um, there's definitely room to grow for the serious game space and the um, the games for you know education or for change or whatever else the ones that are intended to sort of help people learn things mm -hmm. about themselves and about their world um, more so than just having it be purely for entertainment. Uh, yeah, um, is that a question? Um, <laughs> more more of a statement that you can yeah. respond to if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, you know. I used to game, you know, mm -hmm. and I got kind of bored by it, uh, just because the world is a much more interesting game. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking to people, negotiating, finding buildings to perform in, and yeah. what people like, and and finding artists who want to contribute to it, and how to like get an emotion or, or uh, a scene out of a performer. All of that is for me much more intriguing sure. and much more nuanced mm -hmm. uh, and much less predictable mm -hmm. than uh, a game. Sure. You know, games, I usually I would figure out the system and it's like, okay, uh, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and I get bored by it. Uh, so, and I haven't played in a while, but um, it just wasn't, the world's far more interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's far more interesting for me to kind of like go to Hanoi and I've done this. I fly in. I haven't. I haven't. It's like four in the morning. I had no place to stay. Uh -huh. Didn't reserve. I flew in, and I just said, "Okay, I'm gonna find a place." I talked to <laughs> the taxi driver who speaks some English. He took me to a place. I uh, there's a guy sleeping on a couch in the in the lobby. I bang on the door, and I get this great room for like twenty bucks a night. Huh. You know, it's <laughs> like it's more interesting for me to do that to kind of discover something into <laughs> you know what I mean it's like you could say that's, that's a game moment you know sure, what I mean sure. you know find okay which cab driver <laughs> you, know I mean? you know it's uh, like you have the objective find <laughs> shelter for the night and figure it out you know you know and in Alaska when I lived there it was, I kayaked and hiked and all that it was like an enormous game it's like it's it's all a game mm -hmm. that's the best graphics ever <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay that is bear scat that is steaming that means the bear is nearby <laughs> and, you, and you've got yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> and you've got the uh, the sense of smell, which we haven't quite figured out in games yep. either. So. so, I mean, it's like, okay, shotgun. <laughs> right. I mean, it's all, it's a game moment. Right, you know right. I mean? So Fun. Yeah, Karaoke Motel, that's the, the, the piece we're working on now. Mm -hmm. It's part of a trilogy. Okay. It's, uh, the first part was uh, Flesh World, mm -hmm. which dealt with uh, the cycles of life that the trilogy does. Uh, the first Flesh World deals with death. Okay. And so in that, we took audience members from one uh, uh, circle mm -hmm. of death or hell uh, to another, all right? And we progressed them. And it was like we limited it to like 40 people mm -hmm. to different spaces. Was that um, based at all on uh, Dante's Inferno or is it kind of like your own sort of take on it? Dante's Inferno, but Dante's Inferno is also based on, uh, you know, uh, earlier sure. understandings of like Hades and or uh, the other world. Mm -hmm. Which ties again into the uh, the mythology thing where everything draws upon everything, essentially. Right, because when Dante was writing, there was trade routes to India opening mm -hmm. up. And so Hinduism was being influ was, was being transported mm -hmm. one way or another, like written form or in, in tellings of Marco Polo, etc. Uh -huh. So this whole, so as it starts this interchange. And so so they go, ah, that's just like, and so mm -hmm. that's a way of envisioning, you know, our hell, which is never really being envisioned. So you have kind of like this syncretic kind of moment, okay. you know, that happens, and then it becomes Western. It's like spaghetti. We think mm -hmm. it's Italian. It's actually Chinese. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. fireworks were basically, you know, it's Chinese, but we do it in the 4th of July and think it's really American. <laughs> uh, and so, but we don't 
blink an eye. So it's a syncretic moment. Um, so flesh world was death. Whole was the afterworld. Okay. There we had eighteen characters, and all but two were the same soul. Okay. And they're all they're male and female soul, but they would at times the male soul would manifest as female and female as male, etc. And they're essentially trying to sort out all of their previous lives mm-hmm. in order to be reborn. Okay. Karaoke motel is rebirth. Oh, nice, nice. And so, in a sense, we're going through a rebirth, following continuing this this cycle. Uh, and they're not like one continuous story, it's just another take on like, you know, rebirth. The idea here is that we, I feel, are um, at the point of like a new consciousness in the world. We have to, out of survival. Right. Because predictions now are that we have maybe, this is, these are economists, these are like major environmentalists, they're talking 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And they're talking like, um, uh, it's like a major extinction event. Mm-hmm. All right, and right now we're pleasant. We're in a nice building. Everything looks cool. It's like uh, how removed that is, but they're, what they're seeing is like a, a cascade, mm. a cascade that basically can occur, uh, like we know, as a drought in California. Uh-huh. The drought in California next year, food prices go up mm. because we don't have oranges, we don't have broccoli, and all that stuff. People start going hungry. Mm-hmm. People go hungry. They get pissed off, and then they they take to the streets or do something. All right, if the government can't manage it. Right, right, right. Because we have more and more people and fewer and fewer resources. Mm-hmm. So they do that. Then what happens is social order starts breaking down. Mm. Social order starts breaking down, and then people start like renegotiating. Uh, and then you have weather issues, and then you have this cascade effect. It just kind of starts rolling. Next thing you know, you have like this. Uh, um, uh, dissolving of social political structures. Mm -hmm. What happened in Katrina is like, is minor compared to what can happen or what probably will happen uh, if you have many of these events occurring and cascading. Right. And then we have a major extinction event, Mm -hmm. right, which has happened before. So you have major environmentalists saying that um, (laughs) it's it's about grief management now. It's like they've given up on like environmentalism hmm. as far as like saving the world. They think it's a it's a it's 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 done. Too far gone. It's too far gone. It's basically about accepting and living with it and enjoying where you are. Hmm. And that I mentioned that a long way around. That's the premise of karaoke motel. Right. We're basically it's we're rebirthing mm-hmm. and we're going through. It's like what are you going to be born into? We have chances throughout our life. Mm-hmm. A lot of rappers, when they go through another like cycle in their life, they're giving themselves a new name. Mm. All right, that's an old tradition. Right, it's right. like uh, Cherokee did it, and the Arapaho, etc. Mm. Uh, and they do it throughout the world. You get a new name, which would be really cool if we still did that. <laughs> but it's a marker. So yeah. basically, it's a way of forgetting what you were mm. and accepting who you are. Right. So in a sense, there's definitely an environmental like uh, theme that pushes Cherokee Motel. Uh, but it, it 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 basically wants the audience to be aware of uh, of how they have to change and they they need to change mm-hmm. their thinking and there has to be an adjustment in order to move forward back into the world. So it's in a sense a ritual of rebirthing. Gotcha. As we take people through, that's what's occurring, mm-hmm. and you do we do it uh, geographically moving through it, but also through in terms of like sensory interactions. Um, scenic interactions, narrative interactions, mm-hmm. statements, characters, etc. All these things kind of facilitate it uh, to this like engaged, immersive uh, narrative. Very nice. So, and karaoke comes into play in the fact that. Um, Are you having people sing? <laughs> you know, it, the whole thing is karaoke. Okay. You know, um, this conversations happened before. Mm. You know, we just change the words around. You know, I've said stuff like this. You said stuff like that. Sure, and, sure. With your friends, and you just kind of rearranged it. <laughs> so we just kind of did a karaoke, yeah. uh, and that is the sign of a mature culture. Mm. Um, the fact that we have these, why karaoke now? Mm-hmm. I mean, why are people singing karaoke? Uh, it's because they everything's been basically sung before and said before. Right. I hear pop songs now. It's like. 
I heard that in the late 60s, you know, and <laughs> right. now it's like it's coming back. But then, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what traditions do. You get the indigenous traditions. What they'll do is they'll sing the same song over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's not about newness anymore. We're mm -hmm. no longer about newness. Mm -hmm. We've kind of given up on the whole notion of newness. Right, right. We're, we're, right now we're looking at like recombinations mm -hmm. and that can like kind of spark our imagination. But basically newness is out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just basically improving and, and aggregating things that already exist, which is a sign of a mature culture uh, or a dying culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Putting it how you look at it. <laughs> mature tends to be closer to dying than new. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, hey, Doug, I don't want to leave you on a dark note like that. You know? Oh, yeah. I'm having a great time. So that's part of it. Is <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Accept it. <laughs> you know, I got cancer. Okay. All right. Let's do it. You know, I'm going to be at home in a dark room or I'm going to be out in the street and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, going back for a second to um, ritual and myth and um, drawing upon these older ideas, um, you mentioned um, when we were in that class uh, that essentially all myths um, address a number, or like a very small number of kind of core issues to what it is to be mm -hmm. human. Um, and I forget exactly what it was. Maybe you can refresh me. It was, um, you know, birth, um, aging, death, um, the relationship between the sexes. Maturity, right. Mm -hmm. Coming to maturity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sexual maturity. Mm -hmm. um, was, there, was there anything else to that? Because I think that, that that still sort of applies where everything that we write and everything that we read, everything that we um, sort of take in, ultimately can trace back to these sort of core themes, you know, those sort of like primal things that we all have in common. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that uh, even if a story doesn't seem at all to be myth-like, um, it's still drawing on these same sort of structures, these same sort of like relational things, these things about what it is to be alive right. um, that have always sort of been our storytelling. I mean, coming-of-age movies are probably maybe 30% of what's out there. Mm -hmm. Um, or coming to term movies like someone's old or the 40 year old virgin and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's basically it's, it's about coming to terms with something right but you know so how many high school films and you know party <laughs> films and all that it's about coming of age so sure, that sure. so that's in a sense we don't have the ritual but we have the ritual narrated and presented for us mm -hmm. uh, others are like birthing um, whether it's a birth of a child or a rebirth, mm -hmm. uh, something coming to an awareness. So you have this like renewal. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a common trope or theme mm -hmm. that runs through. Birth uh, of a nation, birth of an idea. All that. So yeah, yeah so that, that's a renewal. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of need that. Otherwise, we feel like there's a stasis. Right. Uh, and so we, and you think about uh, consumer um, products where they aggregate. Mm -hmm. It's around birthing, all right? It's a big industry in child care and all that, and right. prenatal and all that. It's around high school kids, like what, you know, or, or going to sexual maturity. I mean, that's a big market for makeup and clothing and, you know, Levi's and the Gap and all that stuff. It's all that era. So they kind of aggregate music, aggregates around those, those that kind of like uh, those life events right. and weddings. Uh -huh. Which, if you're a woman, I mean, it's like it's a multi, probably billion dollar industry, <laughs> uh, and the amount of money people spend on it, and they want to have an idealization mm -hmm. of their wedding that seems to be prominent, uh, is is another area. So in a way, uh, all of these kind of these major life events, ritual life events, are also major economic events, mm -hmm. and so industries and, and consumer products and corporations mm -hmm. kind of like make a lot of money on that. Right. Um, it, it's very interesting to look at any sort of event that is held as being part of some ritual. You know, we don't think of what we do as ritual. We tend to think of ritual as being kind of like this archaic thing or this kind of exotic thing. Um, but, you well, know. Which, which it is. And it's, and it's, let's say it's idealized form. Uh -huh. It is because it served a function for us, a different group. We didn't lose that. Right. It's just we express it differently. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, like, you know, even um, a birthday party, um, you know, like, the, it, we, as a culture, you know, a lot of birthday parties, especially for kids, have the same sort of um, things. And I'm sure we could trace back to where all these sort of symbols come from. But, like, you know, the cake with the candles on it, um, you know, the weird conical hats that we wear. Yeah. Um, well, cake, cake basically is the body. Yeah. You're basically eating the body. Mm-hmm. So when you're cutting a cake, you're basically eating their old body. Mm -hmm. That's the symbolism. Right. 
Right. Which it's uh, you kind of ruin someone when they like have studied <laughs> myth and ritual. It's like, do you do realize what that means, right? What you're doing right there? Um, I'm sure there are like just a ton of things that we take for granted now that like people actually yeah. knew about. They might think twice about, you know. Well, it's, or doing. maybe it it's greater depth. So mm-hmm. if we have a birthday cake. I'm basically I'm I'm helping. I'm participating. In you eating your past right, and right. moving forward, uh-huh. which is healthy for all of us. Yes, because some people don't move forward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they didn't have birthday cake. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and you need it has to be witnessed by your immediate peers and family. Right. So that you don't invite strangers. It's mm-hmm. people who know you. Mm-hmm. And think about, you know, a lot of basketball players, I noticed like they, they, are, they do like tattooing. Mm-hmm. And they'll be tattooing of life events, a birth, a death, uh, something, uh, a moment in their life. And so their body becomes like an illustration of their life. Mm-hmm. And they'll add a tattoo to mark it, mm-hmm. which is actually a very ancient way of using tattooing uh, and or uh, accoutrements like mm-hmm. regalia that you put things on. Right. When you achieve a certain thing, you put it on your body. Yeah. Uh, you wear it, mm-hmm. you know, somehow on the lapel pen, mm-hmm. or you know, I'm a veteran, or whatever. Yeah, you you yeah. put things to to mark these mm-hmm. progressions. Exactly. Uh, so even even though we don't, you know, tattoo our face with our life events anymore, um, like some cultures still do, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, but we'll sort of have our own ways of signifying things. Mm-hmm. Um, even the uh, the wedding ring. Um, yeah. is, I mean, the, the symbol of the circle and et- eternity, faithfulness, all that sort of stuff. Um, the rarity of, um, you know, like gold or diamond or whatever else, or the idea thereof. Um, there was a thing I saw recently that was talking about how big of a hoax diamond rings are as an engagement. Yeah. Thing. Um, but, uh, it's manufactured. Right? Yeah. It plays off of it because mm-hmm. it's a significant, right. but it's manufactured. Yeah. They elaborated on it to um, make money. Um, which, you know, coming back to the, the whole, all the world's a stage, everything's performance, everything is ritual. Um, we go along with it because that's just kind of the expectation. Um, whether or not we think about it, whether or not, I mean, even if you do kind of know the story behind it and why it is kind of just like this weird thing that's happened, mm-hmm. um, you still go along with it because that is your culture, that is what you do. You're scripted. Yeah. I mean, you're scripted to it. And then you're accepted because you're following the script. Mm-hmm. If I give you a script and you just start like, doing your own thing it's like hey man you're not doing the script right right and like i we can't really talk because we're not on the same page Mm -hmm. you know so same thing if you go to a job interview or you're doing things outside the script right the implied script that's why i see we're living in a one big performance and one big we walking through when you walk down the hall you're walking through a narrative Mm -hmm. uh and if you're not aware of it that's one thing if Mm -hmm. you're aware of it you realize ah it's here already Mm -hmm. we've kind of transcended Mm -hmm the need for specialized space. Yeah. Um, And interesting that you point that out, the, uh, you know, walking down the hallway, you know, in this particular case, we're in a school building. Um, We're in the uh, arts and technology building here at UT Dallas. Um, And even the way that the building is designed, um, you know, we we come into it knowing it's supposed to be an academic institution. So there's some expectations there. Um, But then the way that they actually designed this building, there's a lot of open spaces. It's meant to encourage collaboration and meeting Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, Even down to the way that the offices um, aren't closed off. Um, you know, we have offices with doors, but there's also pretty much a one full wall that's just glass facing mm-hmm. onto the hallway. The idea being that they want you to be able to walk down and see that, hey, this professor is there, and that um, if you wanted to talk to them about something, you could because they're there and they're available. Um, the idea that, you know, we're open and we're sharing this sort of thing, that's this, the way this building is designed is intended to reinforce that narrative, um, the intention of having mm-hmm. this building, what we want the program to be versus, you know, we don't want it to be a closed off space. We don't want right. people to be shut in. Um, and a, and a, a designer, an architect who did this building did Google. So yeah. You're, and you're uh, seeing Cartoon a, Network as well. Yeah. Yeah. A meshing mm-hmm. of like academic and corporate. Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're kind of striving a lot of ways to emulate some of the ways that Google thinks and some of the things that they do being um, a front runner in technology. Um, we're trying to have um, a similar philosophy to them. And it's a, an awareness that space, mm-hmm. uh, the formation of space, creates a mental attitude mm-hmm. in how you function. Right. So just to um, revisit this topic one more time, um, so your big project right now is Karaoke Motel. Right. Um, when does that open? How do people find out about it? It's November 20th. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll post 2014. We'll post on our website very shortly uh, tickets and all that. Cool, cool. And we have 
a show, uh, we, we bring in 15 people, every, uh, 16 people every seven minutes. Okay. Uh, and part of the idea is if you're in the first group, you're mm-hmm. coming in, mm-hmm. all right, and you're like already there and you're watching certain scenes and you're moving around, the second group comes in, mm-hmm. you're going, the first group is going, well, are they characters or mm-hmm. are they <laughs> audience members? And then the second group is going, are they characters? Are they audience members? So everything I, I, becomes I, like aware. I remember you mentioned that you even have some uh, actors planted in the audience. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we, we have plants for uh-huh. sure. And we'll do that again. Uh-huh. Um, we treat we call the audience in this performance strangers mm. and everyone's a stranger and we want to make everyone familiar okay uh, as we move through so yeah I can't tell everything because sure. I don't want to spoil you it. don't want to spoil it yeah, yeah I, totally I, I like surprises there's uh-huh. definitely uh, some trickery in there um, and that's part of the, the multi-layering and texturing of it mm-hmm. I like a lot of texture mm-hmm. I like s- I like the nice contradiction of like it's really simple and mm-hmm. what you're watching, but then there's a great deal of like depth and texture mm-hmm. in the contemplation. Sure, um, and that's you know um, we we keep returning to the same point, but the uh, going back to myth and storytelling, um, a lot of mythology has to do with the resolution of contradiction, as you like to say. Um, the idea that you've got two kind of opposing ideas that are coexisting right now, um, but they're in conflict, and we're trying to figure out how to resolve this conflict, and that's essentially what storytelling is, mm-hmm. is trying to figure out um, how we uh, sort of reconcile all these things that are in our world and in our lives that we're trying to yeah. uh, sort out. And that's what drama does. Mm-hmm. That's what a narrative on HBO does. They're trying to reconcile some opposites, right. whether it's political. That's what gaming does. Mm-hmm. It's like... My opposite is I want to succeed to get to level ten or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. And this this ogre is gonna like beat me up, so <laughs> we got something oppositional, uh-huh. you know. So we we see things in in opposites, uh, and in resolution. Mm-hmm. Very nice. So, is there anything else you want to comment on to wrap up? Anything you want to no. say to the people? <laughs> say to the people. No, I'm good. So, I think that's going to do it for us today. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for joining us for uh, the podcast episode number twelve. Uh, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by uh, Tom Riccio. Thanks again for coming out. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us your opinion on theater and live performance. How do you think it compares to newer media such as television, film, and video games? Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.